So there aren't a lot of TV shows that I have stuck with over the years. Uh, I, pren- I, I tend to jump ship pretty early. Uh, I stopped watching The Walking Dead when a certain favorite character was discontinued by a certain wooden object. No spoilers. Um, I stopped watching Stranger Things after season two because the gap between two and three was so long. I started watching three and I was like, I have no idea what's going on and I don't have the time to go back and watch the first two seasons. But one show that I can truly say that I've never missed is Shark Tank. I love this show. I'm thankful to Hulu for allowing me to catch up, fall behind, catch up again. Um, but I watch the show every, every time it comes out. Uh, in fact, don't tell my wife, but I actually bought her Christmas present, and it was totally on an episode just a few weeks ago. Uh, she doesn't watch the show, so hopefully. Uh, but she would be the type to like go and watch the episodes to see what I picked her because she hates surprises. Um, but I, I love this show. But the thing that always drives me nuts about Shark Tank is when somehow like those really dumb inventions get onto the show. I don't understand how they make it past the first few rounds, but eventually they end up on the carpet and their ideas are just terrible. For example, have you all heard of the licky brush before? This is a real thing. I promise you, this is not a gag. This is a real thing. They pitched on Shark Tank. Uh, their, Their slogan was, have you ever wanted to lick your cat? Now you can without the fur balls. And so, I, listen, I know a bunch of you are cat people, um, but we can all agree that this isn't it, right? This, like, even if you have 12 cats, like, this is not a part of your, or it shouldn't be a part of your life. Uh, in fact, I would change the tagline to, have you ever want to lick your cat? This is a sign that you need friends, uh, or you should go to therapy. Uh, no one needs to own this, uh, consider this, anything, but if you are looking for a really good gag gift for Christmas, this, this is the one. Here's another one that was on the show. This is called The Wake and Bacon. Like, I'm telling you guys, this is real. So uh, the idea is that you load raw bacon into the wooden pig looking contraption uh, before you go to bed at night and it just sits at room temperature apparently all night long until <laughs> the alarm goes off the next morning. And so the alarm goes off and it starts to cook the bacon and it's supposed to wake you up so you can enjoy it as soon as you're you open your eyes. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. This was on an episode of The Office, uh, and you are correct. There is an op- episode where Michael Scott, right, George Foreman grill in his bed cooking bacon, wakes him up. And that came out in 2006, and then this dude came out with this idea in 2011. Um, but it doesn't matter where the idea came from. It is a terrible idea. Uh, on the episode of Shark Tank, they actually asked the inventor how he would ensure that the wooden box wouldn't catch on fire. And he responded by saying he wasn't sure and that it might need more testing. This product, <laughs> you cannot find this product anymore. It doesn't exist. Uh, the last one, uh, actually just from a few weeks ago, it's a product called Nana Hats. And it sounds like it's hats for your grandma, which would be cute, but that's not it. Uh, it's hats for bananas. <laughs> This is a real thing. They act- Listen, they actually got a deal, which was like, I guess I'm jumping ship off of Shark Tank as well. So I-, I understand the idea of you wanting to keep your bananas fresh. I even understand that stopping the ethylene gas from leaving the ends of the bananas will keep them fresher longer. Like, that's science. But this is too much, okay? If you're trying this hard, it- it's just too much. People have been using tinfoil for years, and it's been fine. People have been using nothing and just eating the bananas for years, and it's been fine. In fact, people have been taking their rotten bananas, throwing them in a Ziploc, and putting them in their freezer to make banana bread later for years. And guess what? They never actually make the banana bread, and we're still fine, okay? This doesn't need to exist. This doesn't need to be a thing. It definitely didn't need to get a deal. But if you've ever watched a show before, you, you know how it goes when these ridiculous products are pitched. Right? The sharks are ruthless. They tell them that it's terrible, that it won't make any money, and that they're out. But then right before the last shark bails, the person will share this like, really emotional story about how they just wanted to do something that mattered, right? or how they felt lost in their career and they were searching for something more. And what it really comes down to is that these people just want to make a difference, They want their life to matter, and it led them to inventing some really, really dumb crap that people don't need. But if you watch the show, you probably feel the way that I do, right? You think their idea is terrible. You're very glad they didn't get a deal. But then your heart actually goes out to them a little bit. 
because ultimately they just wanted to do something significant with their lives. In 2020, Deloitte Global put out a survey, um, and they reached out to millennials and Gen Z from 43 different countries to better understand what their desires were for life. And one of the questions they asked was, what do you want with your life? Right? What do you want with your life? And they gave options like enough money to retire young, you can start a family, work your way to the top of your field, travel the world. But the number one answer they gave was fascinating. Over 75% of millennials and Gen Z said they wanted to make a positive impact on the world more than anything else, more than money, more than cars, more than social media clout. Their desire was to drive positive change in their community and the world. And I don't really think it matters what generation you're a part of because you probably resonate with this. Right? I think we all want to make a difference. Right? I think we all want to live in a way that leaves this world a better place, to leave things better than we found it. No matter where we stand religiously or politically, most of us have a small desire to make an impact on this world. And so today, we're starting a brand new series called How to Change the World. And here's the inspiration for it. It comes from the Christmas story in Luke 2. Jesus has just been born and the world doesn't really understand it or know it yet, but it's been changed forever. And an angel appears to some shepherds in a field nearby. And this is what happens in Luke 2, starting in verse 8. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And I just love this part of the Christmas story because I love what the angel says. The angel says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. And we're going to dig a little bit more into this on Christmas Eve, but this part of the story really is the baseline for this series because the way that we can change the world is to deliver the good news that brings great joy. It doesn't have to come from the next great invention. It doesn't have to be when we find the next big cure. We don't have to work our way to the top of the highest political office. The way that we, just regular people, can change the world is to bring the good news that brings great joy to the people in our lives. And the good news is that a Savior has been born, that the one who came to rescue us from our sin is here, and we're lucky enough because we kind of get this full story, right? We can zoom out. We get the whole set of the Bible, you know, 2,000 years later. So we know that the good news doesn't just stop at Jesus' birth. Jesus would go on to live a perfect life and die on a cross and resurrect from the dead just like he promised he would. And his resurrection means that we can also experience something new in our lives as well, that we can experience forgiveness, that we can experience grace and endless second chances. And that gives us great joy. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about how we can do whatever we can to bring this good news to our city and to our neighbors and to our families. Because people need this. People need this good news right now more than ever because people, including ourselves, are trying to find good news and great joy in things other than Christ. We're searching for it in our jobs in our relationships, in material possessions, in our own safety and security. But all of these things fall short of the good news of Jesus. And so kicking things off today, we're going to start by reading in the book of Acts. And this is easily my favorite book of the Bible because it's the story of how the church began and went on to change the world. It really is the story about what does it look like to respond to this good news that brings great joy. Right, and I love this book because Collective as a Church exists because of what happened in the book of Acts. And so as you start reading it in Acts 1, what you'll read is that the resurrected Jesus appears to about 120 people. Right, these are people who hadn't abandoned their faith after Jesus was crucified. They didn't walk away. Right? Typically, they believe there was like thousands of people, but when Jesus was put on a cross, there were about 100 people who stuck around. And so Jesus resurrects and he goes to them to prove that he actually is alive, that he actually conquered death. And then later in Acts 1, Jesus ascends into heaven and he leaves this group of people in charge of spreading this good news. He leaves this group of people in charge of changing the world. And then in Acts 2, 
The crowd is gathering in Jerusalem. And so Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, begins to preach the gospel to them. He preaches the good news. He says this in Acts 2, starting in verse 22. He says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. And what he's saying is, hey, you saw this. We're not making this up. You saw the signs. You saw the wonders. You saw the miracles. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grips. Skipping ahead a few verses, he finishes the sermon by saying this in Acts 2, verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. And this is the good news that brings great joy. Jesus is the son of God. He died on a cross for our sins. He was buried in a tomb for three days, but then he conquered death when God raised him back to life. My favorite line in that is death could not keep him in its grip. And he was able to do all of this because he is the Lord and he is the Messiah. He's the one who came to rescue us from our sins and lead us to a better life. And this was and is a life-changing message, and it will be forever. But this is how the people responded to it. Verse 37 says this, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? It pierced their hearts, and they began to believe what Peter was telling them. Ultimately, they began to believe what Peter saw and experienced firsthand. They began to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Savior, And so they want to know, what what do we do? Like, what do we do with this new belief? What do we do? And Peter says, nothing. Just don't do anything. Just like keep it in your heart and and move along, right? Now, of course, he didn't say that. In verse 38, he says, it says, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there are two big pieces of this that I want to dig into today. There are two ways that Peter says we respond to hearing the good news. There are two ways that we respond when the good news of Jesus pierces our hearts. Peter starts by saying this. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn toward God. The word repent comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change one's mind. It's the idea of changing the way that you're thinking. It's the idea of turning away from the life we are living, uh, turning away from sin, of turning away from the direction of pain and destruction that we're currently moving on, and turning 180 toward God. Think about it like this. Have you ever been lost before? How many of you are people that just get lost all the time? Like, this is part of your life? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a brand for some people. Uh, when I was in high school, I went to the 930 Club in D.C. to see the band Something Corporate and Yellow Card. Uh, this was in my peak emo punk days, which I'm not ashamed to admit. It was a great show. But after the show, we started to head out of the city, um, but we didn't actually know where we were going. And this was before smartphones. So if you remember, before a smartphone, what did you do? You went on MapQuest. You typed in the address, then you printed out the directions, you folded them up in your pocket, and you brought them with you. But the issue was we made the rookie move of getting the directions to the 930 Club, but we forgot to print the directions back from the 930 Club. And so we got in the car, and what we did is we tried to follow the directions in reverse, but we were in D.C., so that wasn't possible, right? It's a spoke, not a grid. And so we took maybe one wrong turn or two or three. We we don't actually know, but after driving around the city for a little bit, just looking for a highway number that we understood, We saw a fire truck without its lights on, so we decided to follow it because we assumed at some point it would lead us to a major road, but we assumed wrong Uh, because instead of it leading us into a good direction, it led us under an overpass where there were a ton of cops and ambulances with their lights flashing, and they were all putting spotlights in the crevices of this bridge looking for what we can only assume was a dead body. DC. And so this was when we realized uh, we're not just kind of moving in the wrong direction. We are completely lost. Right? And so what did we do? Well, we didn't keep driving forward. We didn't continue to head under the bridge deeper into who knows what. We stopped. Right? We turned around. We went back toward where we came from so that we could get our bearings and we could eventually head in the right direction. 
And life is the same way. At some point, we will realize that we are moving in the wrong direction and we need to turn around. We will realize that we're living outside of alignment with God and it isn't leading us to good news. It isn't leading us to great joy. It isn't leading us to peace. It isn't leading us to grace. And when we realize this, we have a choice. We can keep moving in the wrong direction or we can change. We can turn around. We can repent. We can bring our life back toward Christ. And so here's the first thing to write down today. Changing the world starts with change in us. Changing the world starts with change in us. We can't change anything until we have experienced our own change, until we have allowed the good news to pierce our hearts. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter how lost we are. It doesn't matter how long we've been heading in the wrong direction. That's all irrelevant because the thing is we can never be too lost. We can never be too far gone. We can never be too separated from God to experience his grace. And so what matters is turning toward him and changing the way that we live, changing how we respond to the hard things in our life, changing how we view ourselves and we view other people, changing what we put our value in, changing where truth comes from in our lives. If we truly want to change the world, we start by changing how we're living. And that's part one. Now let's go back and read the second part of Peter's response. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so part one is of changing the world starts with change within us. Part two is changing the world comes when we live out our faith. Right? That's what Peter is telling that group to do is to live out this change that they're experiencing to respond in action, in repentance, to this piercing of their hearts. And, and I think it's really important that the action that Peter tells them to take is baptism. Right? He doesn't tell them to repent and go serve others. He doesn't tell them to repent and pray for their neighbors. He doesn't tell them to repent and go to church. He doesn't say repent and give 10%. He doesn't say repent and join a small group. Right? Now, those, those are all ways that we live out our faith, and we should do those things. Those are good things. But Peter starts with baptism. He tells the crowd, what do you do? You turn your life toward him, right? And you show that through baptism. And so let's talk about this for a minute. We talk about baptism all the time at Collective, and people ask me, why do you talk about so much? And my answer is, because the Bible does. Baptism is mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. It is a huge deal. And scripture, specifically this scripture and this story, make it very clear that when you experience the good news of Jesus, when you repent and change your mind away from this world and toward the things of God, the way that you publicly show that you are making that decision is baptism. And I want to press in to those of you who've been following Jesus for a long time but have never been baptized. Uh, I used to think naively that I could just share three things about baptism and that's all I needed to do. The first that I would share is that Jesus was baptized. When he was 30 years old, he made the decision out of obedience to God to get baptized. He actually specifically says he did it to carry out all that God required of him. The second thing I thought I could share is that Jesus and his disciples baptized other people. Right? You read this in John 3. That was part of their ministry when they first began. And then the third thing I thought I would share is that Jesus commanded baptism. In Matthew 28, he tells his followers to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I used to think that that would be enough, that if I just shared what Jesus did in his own life, people would be falling all over themselves to take this next step. But five years into leading collective, I have realized that it doesn't work that way. For some reason, for people who follow Jesus but grew up in a church that didn't celebrate baptism, just challenging them to follow Jesus' lead isn't a strong enough teaching. It should be, but it's not. And so let me press in on those of you who have never taken this step before. Uh, and the thing is, I'm not sorry if you get comfortable as we talk about this. That is part of my job is to make you uncomfortable. Pastor Craig Groeschel said that the pastor's role is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, right? <laughs> That's very real at Collective. <laughs> First service, I accidentally said, I'm sorry if this gets uncomfortable. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not sorry. But, but here's the thing. Some of you choose comfort every single day when it comes to your faith. 
Some of you would rather choose comfort than declaring your faith and putting your faith in Jesus than following what Scripture teaches. So let me break this down a little bit further. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which literally means to be immersed in water. It means to be dunked. Baptism is the physical action that represents what is going on in the faith in your heart. It represents that repentance, that change, that turning around. Baptism symbolizes our own death, burial, and resurrection. It's death to the old way that we were living in, the old way that we were thinking. It's the burial of our old selves and the rising up as a new creation. Scripture talks about it like putting on new clothes, becoming a new self. And every conversion story in the book of Acts, the start of the church, goes like this. Someone shares the good news of Jesus with them, they believe, and then they get baptized. Right? And if you read the book of Acts, you'll realize that this includes people who had faith and people who didn't have faith. The first half of the book of Acts is taught to Jewish people, people who had a fundamental belief in God. Honestly, people who'd experienced immersion before in their life because it was a ritual part of cleansing in order to go into the synagogue. They'd experienced that before, but Jesus came to change it. But then you read the second, book, the second half of the book of Acts, and it's all people we call Gentiles who had no faith, who had no understanding of God, but they both respond the same way to this good news, repentance and baptism. Now, baptism is also a choice that you have to make for yourself. This is really important. Your parents cannot make that decision for you, right? Students, your parents can't make that decision before you, right? They want you to do that, but that is on you to make that decision, right? This also means some of you grew up and are are adults and your parents made that decision for you at some point. When you're a baby, maybe you grew up in a denomination where you turn a certain age and they say, well, this is the response to turning that certain age, but you still didn't choose it. You have to make that decision for yourself. But the other thing is your pastor can't make that decision for you. Right? That is not my decision to make. Your significant other can't make that decision for you. And I know uh, that there are a ton of you who were sprinkled as babies in the church by your parents. And we could talk about the whole reason sprinkling started happening in the early church and how um, really a church split, the worst church split in the history of the church, led to some denominations sprinkling and some continuing to immerse. We can talk about the fact that there's no history of sprinkling of infants in the Bible, and it didn't actually show up till hundreds of years later when there was a plague devastating Rome. We could talk about the theology of it, right? We can talk about how misinterpretations of the Old Testament and how we read scripture regarding original sin had influenced the tradition of baptism. But here's what really matters. If you grew up and your parents made this decision for you, your parents deciding for you to be a part of this sacrament and your parents choosing to publicly commit to raising you to love and follow Jesus was a great decision by your parents. That was a really good decision by them. But when your parents made this decision, they never wanted it to stop your faith from growing. They never intended this to be a sticking point for you. When they made this decision for you, their prayer was that one day you would choose for yourself to follow Jesus. It wouldn't be their choice. It wouldn't be a priest's choice. It wouldn't be when you turn 13 and hit that certain age. It would be a choice that you made for yourself, that you would choose to live out your faith. And baptism is a part of that. You didn't make the decision to get baptized when you were a baby. There was no repentance. There was no changing of your mind. You didn't put your faith in Jesus in that moment. You didn't choose that next step in your own life. And so at some point, if you continue to read Scripture... You continue to read the Bible, continue to read the book of Acts. You will have to wrestle with what does it look like in your own faith to do this. You will have to wrestle with publicly declaring your faith in Jesus through baptism in the same way that 3,000 people did after Peter preached this message, in the same way that the apostle Paul would later do, even though he grew up in the faith and he had faith and he was like one of the best Jewish people that ever existed. Jesus interrupted his life and said, hey, there's more for you. And you're going to have to wrestle with this in the same way that every person in the book of Acts did after hearing the good news. And so ultimately, this is how some of you need to finish up your year. This is how some of you need to move into this next season of your life. It's baptism. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, I cannot think of a better time than right now. I just think it's a great way to celebrate the birth of our Savior and the hope that it brings. I think it's a great way to go into the new year with a new you that's gone from death to life. And the challenge is the same for those who have been following Jesus for a while and have never been baptized. 
Because the longest gap between faith and baptism in the Bible is three days. Three days. And so for some of you, you've never gone public with that action through your faith. And baptism is how you do it. And now's the time. Right? And you wrestle with this all the time. I know you do because we talk about it all the time. But if you are ready to take that next step, whether faith is new to you or you've been following Jesus for years and have never actually done this, now's the time. Because changing the world starts with us living out our faith. And one of the easiest ways that we do that one of the simplest ways that we do that is baptism. Now, I know we're talking a lot about baptism, and, and I know that some of you are wondering, okay, so why does this matter in the whole kind of realm of this series? The reasons why this matters is because if we can't make the easy decision of following Jesus' lead, of doing what Jesus did in his own life, and following Peter's teaching when it comes to living out our faith and getting baptized, what are we going to do when it comes to the hard actions of living out our faith? How are we going to respond to the hard things that Jesus asks us to do in action? And really, how are we all going to respond over the next few weeks as we begin to be challenged about how we bring this good news that brings great joy? Right? If we can't publicly make this decision, will we ever publicly talk about our faith? Will we ever show our faith to others? Or will we try to hide that as well? Because a hidden faith is not a world-changing faith. A passive faith is not a world-changing faith. A secret faith is not a world-changing faith. An afraid faith is not a world-changing faith. Later on in the New Testament, um, Jesus' half-brother James uh, wrote the book of James. And this is what it says, uh, James 2, starting in verse 14. He writes, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? What James is asking is, can a faith without action change the world? Can a faith without action save anyone? Can a faith without action actually make an impact on someone's life? He continues, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. And he's saying the inevitable byproduct of faith is action, right? If we have been pierced to the heart, if we've repented and changed the way we're living and turned toward God, the response to that is that we live it out, that it shows in the way that we live our life. James continues, now some one may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Again, he's saying a faith you can't see isn't faith. You, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Now, this feels like James is being condescending, and that's because he is. He's kind of being a jerk right here. And we've all had these conversations before with people in our life where they say, well, I, I believe in God. I, I just don't go to church. Right? I, I just don't pray. I don't, I don't read my Bible, but I believe. And what James, James is saying is that he's not impressed by this. He says, hey, congratulations, you believe in God. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Because believing in God is about as basic as you can go when it comes to faith. Right? Just saying, I believe in God with no action doesn't really mean much. And he says, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Right? So show me you believe in God. Let me see how your life represents your belief. And what James is pointing out is that if we can't show it, then we probably don't have it. If we can't show that our life has been impacted by good news that brings great joy, then we probably haven't really experienced it. We're probably searching it out in other things other than God. Right? And we know this is true because of other areas of our life, not just faith. If you say your kids are important to you, show me what you did with them this week. If you say that your marriage is important, show me your calendar and the date nights you've been on. If you say school is important, show me your grades. If you say you're generous, show me the proof of what you've given. If you say that telling other people about Jesus is important, show me who you invited to church this week. Because if you can't show it, we don't have it. And the point is, whatever you believe shows itself out in action, whether you want that to be true or not. So if we can't show our faith, it's probably not there. Now listen, we're all in different places when it comes to faith and, and trusting Jesus. And so everybody's action is going to be different. Everybody's next step is going to be different, and that's okay. 
But if we can't show what our next step is, the question is, is it really there? And then skipping ahead a few verses, James finishes with this. He says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Bottom line, faith without action is lifeless. It is a dead faith because faith expresses itself in action. And it's one thing to say that you have faith, but it's never to live in a way that shows your faith. It's one thing to say that we want to change the world, that we want to make an impact, that we, that we generally want things to change for the better, but it's another to live in a way that actually proves it. And changing the world starts with us living out our faith. The angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people, right? all people. And so this isn't just for us. It isn't just for people who believe. It's not just for people who are in this room today or people who are online at home recovering from all the Thanksgiving chaos. This is good news and great joy for everyone. And one of the things that Jesus asks us to do is to carry this message into the world. Right? That's how we change the world. But before we can even get to this point, we have to experience change in our own life. And we have to make the choice to live out our faith. And so I know for me personally, I want this world to be a different place. Right? I want to make an impact. I want to change the world. And I think you do too. And so over the next few weeks, as we continue this series, let's lean in. Let's feel uncomfortable Let's feel challenged to live out our faith in a way that changes everything, not just for ourselves, but for other people. Let's pray. God, I think uh, when it comes to faith, we really love um, the grace. God, we, we really love the forgiveness. Um, God, we, we even love the idea of being made new and really having the opportunity to change. But God, we really struggle with showing that to other people. God, we really struggle with living out our faith in a way that brings good news uh, and great joy to the people around us. And so God, as we head into this Christmas season and, and we're kind of surrounded by all the commercialism, God, we're surrounded by... Um, you know, the lights and, and the garland and the trees and things that kind of cover up what's really going on. God, God I pray that we as a church um, don't get distracted by the things that look good um, because, God, we're leaning into the things that really matter, and that's a relationship with you. So, God, I just pray for all of us here um, that faith isn't just something that we hold on to. It isn't just something that we keep inside um, but God, I pray that we are, we are pierced to the hearts by this good news, and our life shows that in everything that we do. And so God, I just pray uh, for the people here that are wrestling with what does that look like. God, really, I, I pray for the people here that are wrestling with baptism. Um, God, that they kind of get out of their own head or um, they stop worrying about what their mom or their grandma would feel. Um, God, they start leaning into the way that you lived your life, the way that we're called uh, to live our life. God, ultimately, at the end of the day, let us be a group of people who love you in such a way that it shows in our actions and in the ways that we love other people. God, thank you and love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.